Uh, once again, I am Racine Brown. Uh, I'm an applied anthropologist by uh, trade there. And I, um, so I also have got a PhD in applied anthropology from University of South Florida. And in previous uh, iterations, so to speak, I've done work in food insecurity uh, research, uh, health research, as well as some user experience research uh, for startups prior to joining Radiant. So that's what I want to talk to you today um, about user using user experience research or UX research for short to optimize software design. A bit of the flow of the presentation, I'll introduce the concept a bit uh, and then talk about typical uh, workflows of UX design with UX researchers and designers, uh, types of UX research designs or research designs that are used in UX research. Um, and then factors that help uh, UX research be a real value add in building the right thing. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up and take some questions. So in recent years, uh, the important concept of user experience or UX has become prominent in design and development of software, uh, as well as hardware and other innovative technologies. It's part of the design thinking approach as depicted on the graphic on the right, uh, such that in most shops, user experience designers and user experience researchers uh, work hand in hand uh, throughout the um, design thinking life cycle, design thinking cycle in an integrated manner. And the end goal of this is to keep in touch with the actual end user and not just design cool ideas in a vacuum. And what this does is by uh, spending a bit of time to do research and empathize and prototype on design on the front end, it saves time and money and headaches on rework on the back end. Before we go on, I'd like to talk a little bit about the origins of UX research. Uh, it's mainly in the social sciences. Uh, you have um, prominent UX researchers today include sociologists such as Sam Laudner and anthropologists such as Ken Anderson, uh, other uh, practitioners in psychology and human computer interaction. So let's uh, just want to discuss where UX research fits into the design cycle to clear where UX research is sort of the lead effort. Uh, and in, see in the understanding phase, you have empathize and define. So empathize is learning about uh, user, what their uh, process are, what, a, what they're trying to do, uh, needs and pain points. Uh, defining is defining uh, things, sort of synthesizing research insights into hypotheses, uh, jobs to be done, outcome statements, and so forth. Uh, user experience researchers tend to lead there, maybe some assistance from UX designers. Uh, and then in the ideate and certainly uh, the prototyping phases, uh, UX designers tend to be in the lead and UX researchers might assist. And then we get around to the testing phase of testing those prototypes and UX researchers, uh, when they're present in a shop, tend to lead that effort as well. So in a sort of complementary fashion that we'll talk about in just a moment. So next, I would like to transition into talking about the types of research design used in UX research. Uh, there's discovery research, uh, exploratory or formative research, and um, evaluative or summative research. And I wanna talk about each of those in turn. So uh, discovery research, the purpose of this is to delve deeper into discovering hidden needs and pain points of users. Uh, I call this a pathfinding process uh, for uncovering information. This, and the purpose of this is to conceptualize a new digital experience or technology. So rather than uh, trying to validate an idea uh, for an app or other technology, it's discovering what is needed and from using that, those insights to formulate ideas for a new app, um, software, or other experience. Uh, it's conducted prior to the design cycle. I uh, just wanted to highlight a case study. Uh, I did some work with a startup called Javelin Technology in which the research team uh, did discovery research, including uh, interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews and surveys of the initial target market in London. 
about how people got to know and trust their neighbors to uh, that led to the idea for an app to um, help people get to know their neighbors better. And then the second phase of that discovery research was uh, the bit, there was a business decision to pivot that uh, MVP target market to Dubai. And so we did something called a netnography, which focused on uh, interest group feeds for expatriates in the Dubai market on social media um, to hone in the idea for that app. So methods used for discovery research include ethnography, uh, contextual inquiry, and workshops. And I'll talk about each of those in a bit more detail. So ethnography is a process of a way of doing research uh, that includes you know, some several different methods, uh, but it's a, an approach uh, to capture rich insights about the human experience, including experience as a customer or tech user. A uh, distinctive feature of ethnography is intensive data collection period over longer periods of time than is typical in other research methods. Uh, ethnography originated in academic basic research and disciplines such as anthropology, to a limited extent, uh, also sociology, geography, uh, community psychology in some cases. And so in those cases, uh, data collection could last over months or a year or more. Business research, that is not typical uh, for obvious reasons, I think, but um, bit data collection can last for several hours or even over a few days per uh, respondent or user. And the reason for that is you are collecting not just observations about a particular workflow or task, you're collecting broad contexts uh, such as social relationships within the workplace or between uh, companies, what have you, that surround um, the phenomenon you're, you're studying. Uh, methods include immersive observation, and I'm defining immersive observation as just really detailed um, observation of the phenomenon you're trying to study, say a workflow, as well as the context, who else the, the user interacts with, uh, what they do through the day, and, and later analyzing, see how that fits through, fits with the, um, the workflow. And if it's appropriate to design, immersive observation might even involve um, practicing the workflow or task or other phenomenon of interest. Another method in ethnography is semi-structured interviews where the researcher has set questions, but unlike a survey, lets the respondent answer in their own words. And a survey will tell you how generalizable a phenomenon is because you can get a large sample, but uh, semi-structured interviews can, by giving the respondent much freer answer choices, can yield much more thick data or rich data uh, a lot more fine grained detail about uh, the experience being studied and also about why people do what they do. Uh, important considerations for doing ethnography is that you wanna have um, a lead or moderator and note taker if possible and detailed notes should be written up after the session as soon as possible to uh, because those notes become data, become the insights uh, once they're analyzed. Also, it's important to do some sort of recording, if at all possible, video recording, audio, photographs, or some combination thereof, depending on the project. And that does a few things. That provides uh, sort of really encapsulating visual images of what you're studying, you know, what pain points you're trying to solve. You can get really pithy uh, quotations about uh, the workflow or other phenomenon from uh, the audio, or, um, you know, and it also helps uh, amplify your notes and those recordings act as data later in the analysis phase. So um, the next method is contextual inquiry. Uh, and the purpose of this is to undertain, obtain, excuse me, a fine grained understanding of how a process or workflow works quote in the field or in real life, rather than how it's supposed to work according to policy manual, SOP, or believed to work by rule makers. And the point I want to make here is not saying that workers are deceitful or users are deceitful, but uh, generally policy manuals um, 
and policy represent the ideal of how some things work. But in many cases, uh, certainly in my experience, people on the, the front lines, if you will, doing the actual work, uh, find imperfections or gaps in the policy and have to find workarounds um, or shortcuts to do the work. And you, you wanna, when you're um, designing a new app or technology, you wanna solve for what actually is rather than what the ideal is. Um, so uh, this involves detailed observations of workflow processes or events. And at the same time, uh, the researcher asks the respondent or user to think aloud while doing. So they describe what they're doing and what they think or feel about it while they're doing it. And the point of that exercise is getting detailed observations of the steps of the workflow, but also uh, building a more holistic picture or triangulating with okay, here's where I think, you know, I've, I've learned this, I can do this step, but this is difficult to learn at first, or I really like this process. Um, so you're combining uh, thoughts and feelings with an objective observation of the workflow. Uh, difference between contextual and ethnography, contextual inquiry and ethnography is contextual inquiries tend to be more bounded in time. Uh, it might be over a couple hours rather than a day or so, and also more bounded in focus, uh, just focus mainly on the workflow in question. Uh, they can incorporate a concluding interview. Uh, typical things I like to ask in those cases are what are the user's overall impressions of the current process or uh, technology are, uh, anything they think is a must keep work well, and then certainly about those challenges or pain points. As with ethnography, it's important to video record, audio record, photograph, or both uh, to capture that visual and audio record. And also uh, you wanna have a moderator and, and note taker to take detailed notes. So the last method I want to talk about for discovery research or workshops. They're similar to focus groups in that they elicit data from a group, uh, but are more participatory than focus groups. Um, they actually not only ask uh, users or participants what they think, but ask them to show their knowledge by doing something. Uh, and this approach elicits ideas and also buy-in from user groups. Uh, empathy sessions can be uh, incorporated into a workshop where you're asking about current process and you know asking for thoughts and feelings about that. Brainstorming. Uh, similar to ideating, where you ask for, I, the researcher asks for ideas, any sort of idea. So we're not uh, limiting the scope or, or judgment about the feasibility or brilliance of the idea, but the, the, the uh, goal is quantity and then um, later sifting through the ideas to see about feasibility and desirability. Uh, journey mapping is another process where collaboratively with the users, the research team maps out the steps of a process, you know, a workflow or using an app, and then sub steps as uh, can be seen some, well, so much of that uh, graphic with the sticky notes. Um, and journey mapping can be done uh, with sticky notes in an in-person session or using graphical tools in a virtual session. Subject matter expert panels are also a type of workshop where you, um, talk to not just the general population or general users, but people with deep subject matter expertise in what you're trying to study and get a sort of consensus from them and possibly some artifacts um, about the current process or technology. So some characteristics of workshops, they tend to produce artifacts, uh, you know, sticky notes or flip chart pages, drawings, et cetera. And those should be treated as data. And so uh, it's important to photograph or screen capture the end state of those artifacts. And what you do depends on what kind of workshop it is. If it's in person, taking a digital photograph and then uploading to your data repository is the best way. Uh, for virtual uh, workshops, the most efficient way is a screen capture. So with that, I'd like to transition to the next type of UX research uh, design, and that's formative or exploratory research. Uh, somewhat similar to discovery, but formative research designs are most useful in the understanding phase of the design cycle, uh, empathize and define, um, and are incorporated at the beginning of the design or redesign process. 
In this case, a basic concept or software idea might exist, but what you want formative research for is to either gain insights to optimize that design, or if the insights uh, and themes surface during the research indicate the design is a bad idea, this is your checkpoint to say, okay, it's time to pivot to something else. And then you know, this process starts over again. Uh, formative uh, research may use qualitative methods uh, such as workshops um, or semi-structured interviews. Um, it could also use quantitative methods such as the system usability scale or SUS. Um, and that is a validator measure that gets at people's uh, opinions or attitudes about how usable a software is. Uh, and this is graphic is just a representation of the type of scoring in the SUS. So complementary to formative research is summative research. And that's used to evaluate how usable, intuitive or desirable a technology product is. Um, and so this is often used to test prototypes um, and do re reiterations. Methods for this include usability testing, which is depicted in the graphic here. And in usability testing, you'll have some sort of prototype and uh, ask the user to complete a series of tasks and uh, think aloud during those tasks. And it may or may not incorporate interview questions in the user testing, usability testing guide, depending on the needs of the project. Uh, so it's important to see, okay, how quickly, um, do users uh, complete the tasks? Do they hover somewhere where they're not supposed to? Um, are they having trouble finding the right button or what have you to complete the task? Do they ask for help? Uh, generally in a usability test, uh, it's best not to help, uh, just the user just say, please do the best you can. But that is data when someone's too confused to, um, to navigate through the prototype. Uh, another variant is A-B testing where you have uh, two different um, variants of the prototype and test which one is more usable. A heuristic evaluation is a sort of walkthrough of the prototype with an expert uh, with pre using predefined rules to determine how usable the prototype is. Uh, subject matter expert panels may also be used uh, for some of the research. Uh, the SUS may off also and often is used for some of the research. Another uh, way of doing some of the research for a live prototype or an MVP is web analytics. Um, click analytics to see how many clicks it takes, uh, heat maps to show where hovers are and if they match where people should click to do the tasks, uh, drop offs, things of that nature, um, time on tasks um, can also show on the back end how usable the prototype um, or app is. So before I go on the value add of UX research, uh, I just want to show you this graphic as a sort of continuum. You have the idea on uh, or concept on the left, the solution as an artifact on the right, and where different types of research fit on formative versus summative research. A literature review or you know, looking in scholarly literature to see what else has been done is a type of formative research, ethnography. Uh, the user testing, um, you know, I've talked about as summative research, but if you take the design uh, thinking cycle as a cycle and not a linear trajectory, it could also serve as formative research to um, test the prototype and reiterate for the next iteration of the prototype. A questionnaire is typically used for summative research and then those web analytics like I discussed. So now I'd like to talk about um, how UX research can be used or aid in building the right thing and what factors um, help that effort. And the first is a deep knowledge about people. Uh, most uh, UX researchers are trained social scientists or have deep training in UX research programs such as at Nielsen Norman Group and are good listeners and observers. And also in that training, I have thorough training in highly effective research methods uh, to find out about users' pain points. Uh, design integration, uh, typically UX researchers are integrated with design teams uh, and have mutual assistance between researchers and designers. Uh, UX researchers are adaptable and agile environments. Um, 
by learning about the process of UX research, learn, learn about uh, the design cycle and how that facilitates rapid and flexible prototyping and have a mentality of minimizing rework. So lastly, I'd like to talk about, I think the most important factor, which is meeting users where they are. And that goes back to that social science, that people-centric orientation. Um, and important thing here is that the innovation journey includes users as well as the product team. So just to wrap up here, uh, UX research empowers digital innovation uh, by meeting users where they are, um, meeting their actual user needs in a highly usable and relatable manner. It is a rapidly growing and transformational area in the technology landscape, not only for startups and flagship tech companies, but a lot of legacy enterprises such as bank, for instance, are also um, getting on the UX research bandwagon. Um, so Radiant helps organizations check all those boxes in enterprise software design with competitive UX research services um, that can guide a winning corporate strategy in this new digital economy. So please uh, connect with us uh, to customize UX research plans. And here is our contact info to do so. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, let's go ahead and open the live Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Okay. I'll go ahead and start. Sure. Um, first question is, can you tell me more about how you got into UX research? Certainly. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps in 2004, I didn't really know what UX research was, but I knew I wanted to be an anthropologist. And at the time, I thought I wanted to be an academic anthropologist and a professor. Um, so I went through graduate school, um, came down here to, to Tampa, to University of South Florida to do a um, PhD program in applied anthropology because I thought I could be a professor and also help people make an impact. Um, the, um, so I did a lot of work in uh, food security and livelihoods. The professor route didn't quite work out, um, but in the end, that's probably for the best because I kind of wanted to get out uh, either nonprofits or business. So I uh, worked for the VA for a while doing healthcare or health services research, um, wrote a grant for what they call a career development award for early um, scholars. Um, that didn't quite work out, but I started to learn um, via my network in the American Applied, American Anthropological Association, excuse me, um, people I met uh, on LinkedIn, people I met in Tampa about UX research. And I thought it was just really fascinating because you use the same uh, methods uh, and sort of uh, perspective of an anthropologist, but seeing what impact one's findings have in in real time. Uh, in academic research, uh, for it, it can take a few years to get findings from a study published. It can take several years after that for it to have any impact on policy, uh, health, what have you. In UX research, um, one can see the impact of one's research very within weeks. Um, so that really appealed to me. So that was uh, a few years ago, I got, um, you know, started making the transition, uh, did some startup work, um, you know, consulting about research designs and did some uh, small, some research projects uh, for startups as well. Uh, and then I came to Radiant and uh, the rest is history as they say. Thanks Dr. Brown. Um, here's another question. Can UX research be used to build the right thing in other spaces besides software? Um, yes, it's actually broadly applicable uh, to technology. Uh, one, one could use the same processes adapted to build hardware as well. And there's also something called service design, um, which is using very similar research and design processes from design thinking, but rather than focusing on a particular app or suite of apps, it's making um, 
a service uh, better. So in some ways, it kind of uh, combines uh, lean and UX research, but it's uh, you know not just focusing on the software, but making an entire service better and more responsive to user needs. So it can uh, be used uh, beyond the software space. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, here's one more question. It says, um, can you explain, or can you please explain a little bit more on heuristic evaluation under Samaritan research? Oh, well, um, that's a really good question. I'm not gonna claim uh, deep expertise on heuristic evaluation. That's not one of my strongest methods, but um, what it is, is there are, you know, like an expert on that type of software or that type of process uh, will either develop or collaboratively develop um, preset uh, logic rules and almost like a rubric and then use that those logic rules or rubric to sort of rate or evaluate um, the app kind of uh, feature by feature or page by page. Okay, um, here's another question. In which situation would, uh, will you pursue ethnography study versus contextual inquiry and not only in terms of time, but in terms of outcome of the study when realistically you will need a large perspective from ethnography study or when realistically will you need a large perspective from ethnography study? Well, um, as an anthropologist, I'm biased toward ethnographic approaches um, generally. Um, I mean, I think ethnography always give you a broader perspective of the phenomenon. Um, realistically, um, in you know, tech and sometimes in market research, time is a limiting factor. And also, uh, I think it depends on details such as you know, what all do you want to know? How big the project is you're trying to do? How big the need is? If you're really just wanting to focus on a specific workflow, um, you know, if the project or engagement is just, hey, we want to improve uh, this workflow or this process, um, contextual inquiry will probably be enough. Uh, it can be done a little more timely. Um, in some cases for pathfinding research, like, okay, we want, you know, at a more strategic level, we want to identify uh, hidden pain points that we, we, the business, don't even know about, but could be a real business opportunity. Uh, in those cases, uh, an ethnographic approach would, you, you could argue for other methods uh, in terms of, of costs and time, but, but an ethnographic approach would really add value because by looking at the context of, of things surrounding the particular phenomenon, you might find things that affect that phenomenon or insights that you would have missed just doing the contextual inquiry. Uh, for instance, workflow, you know, how much does it depend on the specific process and how much does it depend on say good relationships with coworkers or people in other um, in other teams or sections, and that so so like that kind of question, you would get an incomplete answer from contextual inquiry potentially. But if you do an ethnography and spend a little more time, the degree to which uh, relationships are realistically important for doing the job well might get um, surfaced, and then you know that leads more, to more strategic thought how to facilitate the relationships, for instance. So it, um, there's no cut and dry answer to that question, but I think the, you know, the bigger opportunity you're looking for and the more strategic the goal is, probably the, the um, more you wanna consider an ethnographic approach. Mm, thank you, Dr. Brown. Those, and uh, thanks to our audience. Those were some great questions today. Um, let's go ahead and end here so we can stay on schedule. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up and of course, uh, Dr. Rustin Brown uh, for the great presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Uh, a copy of this uh, recording will be available on our website, www.radiant.digital and our YouTube channel. Okay, thanks, have a good day. Thank you.